If you're on a budget and want narrative in a game, chances are fully animated cutscenes are outside your scope, especially if you want some kind of player choice. If you want voice acting on top of all that, then it's even more likely. Whenever I step away from this skyscraper-sized budgets of AAA games and curl up with more budget experiences, I'm once again greeted with text boxes, and it's comforting. I grew up with voice acted text boxes, so for me part of the comfort comes from reliving those long gone days of my childhood, back before I became the insufferable cynic I am now. The other part has to do with the qualities of engagement. It might take more mental effort to play a game requiring a fair amount of reading, but once you're over that hurdle, you're often more invested in the world than if you were presented with a pretty cinematic. What we gain through cinematics is accessibility, but we so often lose the more personal nature of filling in those blanks for ourselves. Part 1. Immersion Immersion has become one of my least favorite buzzwords surrounding games, mostly because of how narrowly it's been focused. I write for more than just games, and immersion is something any well-constructed experience can give you. Hell, theater can be one of the most immersive experiences you can find, and it's thousands of years old. Tabletop games and LARPing are still arguably the most immersive things available from an interactive narrative perspective. Video games, however, have fallen for the idea that immersion is a technical issue, when in reality it's more of an issue with user experience and presentation. Before I keep going, I want to remind everyone that immersion and suspension of disbelief are extremely subjective and personal. Even going by immersion's definition, we can see it's not only a technical issue of rendering a wall more realistically, it instead is about mental involvement, or why theater and D&D are immersive. So in the end, you only really need to do one thing. Make something compelling enough and people will forget they're sitting in a room. To put this entire section bluntly, just because a game uses text boxes or just text in general as its primary narrative tool doesn't mean it can't be immersive. Just because a game has wall textures that would blow your mind and lighting effects that are prettier than real life doesn't mean a game is immersive. Just because a game forces you to strap a TV to your face doesn't mean it's immersive either. This last point is really the crux of why I even have this section in the video. I have nothing against VR, but the idea that it'll finally be what creates true immersion ignores the millennia of entertainment up to now. VR is not the end-all be-all of immersion. Creating something thoughtful and engaging is. At the end of the day, reading a text box isn't any more or less immersive than playing a game with a VR headset if they both make you forget you're reading text or strapping a screen to your head. Part 2. Seamlessness is not the ideal. To build on my criticisms of the popular usage of immersion, the belief that everything needs to be seamless misses the greater point about how narrative and gameplay can work together. Regardless of the production values on a project, a tacked on story is still a tacked on story. Just because a game has what I'd call a briefing section, e.g. text boxes with some looping animations or just a picture, doesn't mean a story is tacked on. Instead of focusing on the surface level criticisms of presentation, which only really serve to point out budgetary constraints, Looking at how a game's narrative and gameplay interact will go much further in determining if the story is tacked on. A game like Brigador obviously didn't have the resources of a full AAA studio at its disposal, but the narrative they built has more character and personality to it than simply being an excuse to blow stuff up. Each briefing detailing the upcoming level is laced with dark, often fatalistic humor, and a particular standout is one level where a man hires you to remove an occupying force in his home district, even after being provided with various articles talking about commonplace collateral damage. Oh, and your employer's interests happen to align with clearing the section of city out anyways. Breaking away from gameplay entirely to have a story moment might seem like a ham-fisted, immersion-breaking decision, but the fact that these breaks in gameplay are providing nearly all the continuity and context makes their inclusion all the more important. With each level in Brigador, I know both the overarching reason why I'm stomping around blowing up buildings, as well as why I'm in a specific area under specific circumstances. All it took was a carefully crafted paragraph or two, and my stomping around has far more meaning than if all that happened was I picked a mission and had nothing to go on but its title. I'm not saying there aren't story elements in the gameplay sections, they're just more subtle and mainly found in the artwork and level design rather than explicit text or dialogue. The wooden houses of a residential area are far less constrictive and resource intensive to plow through than the volatile buildings of a gas field or the heavy concrete of a necropolis and help flesh out the experience through gameplay. Something to keep in mind with this segmented and rhythmic style of storytelling is the symbiotic relationship between gameplay and narrative. The gameplay should be able to stand by itself, and Brigador's freelancer mode is proof enough. The simple vehicle customization of a chassis, two weapon hardpoints, and a defensive utility allow for a massive variety in experiences, from slow-moving heavy artillery doomed in close-range encounters, to stealth units unable to survive a stand-up fight, with everything else in between. Combine this with carefully crafted neighborhoods turned mission areas, and the gameplay has plenty of depth and breadth. Freelance mode's only real shortcoming is its almost total lack of context outside of go blow things up. The gameplay is fun enough, but it's missing the dark humor prefacing the campaign missions that add a small but important piece of context and rationale for deploying on the next mission. Whether it's the silly aside of a man wanting to go home regardless of the cost, or fleeing a city, a paragraph or two can spark some thought about what you're doing. It's this ability to spark thought that makes these cheap stories compelling. Text may be dry to start with, but it allows you to fill in many more blanks for yourself. 
Every player gets to own bits of any character or event. Both the character's motivation and the details of their actions are in your hands. Exactly how a plot point unfolds is no longer just up to the author. With a little more investment from you, that character or event is now yours, and even if just slightly different from every other person's version. With ownership comes interpretation, and it's common to see less elaborately told stories generate far more fan interest in discussing interpretations of that story. Just look at Dark Souls. Unlike a book, these cheap stories and games have their gameplay as another way of filling in those blanks. Again, it involves the player, this time changing the minute plot details as they play. That might not be important in a book, but all the close calls, missed shots, and ambushes are what makes everyone's experience of the story unique. And because we're in the realm of little to no money, most of the plots in these types of cheap stories I'm discussing are advanced through gameplay. Brigador's simple plot combined with its sandbox-style missions works without heavy contextualized scripting, meaning the narrative surrounding each area can be fiddled with as much as needed without impacting the level itself, which is a pretty big deal when on a tight schedule and budget. Also importantly, any changes to a level can easily be applied to the narrative segments with simple, though not easy, editing. This isn't always the case with cheaply told stories, and Free Space is a heavily scripted and deliberately paced experience both in its gameplay and writing. I'll admit Free Space is a step up in complexity from the text to sandbox of Brigador, but not by much. Its events are often little more than triggers to spawn additional ships or destroy them, or playback lines of dialogue, and due to the game's setting are where most of the mission design time is spent, rather than building environments. In spite of each mission having all of its events hand-placed, Free Space still maintains a relatively sandbox-esque feel, in part due to the gameplay leveraging the enemy AI for all it's worth, just as Brigador does. A mission in Free Space can be thought of in a similar way to a stage play. The mission script is the structure and it's up to the actors, the player and AI, to make it to the next beat. Another curiosity about Free Space and many sim games from the same era is that while they're heavily scripted, they don't allow for breaks when major set pieces are firing. One of my particular favorites is in Faint Parry Repost when the Colossus and Repulse duke it out. Instead of allowing you to put your feet up and watch the fireworks, you are still responsible for defending yourself and the repulse being a flagship isn't just for show. It'll send wings of fighters after your squadron until it's destroyed as a reminder that you're in a real war or as real as World War II in space with lasers gets. Whether these moments were a conscious choice or a limitation of technology and scheduling is beside the point. Event triggers without interrupting the gameplay created special moments where the narrative and gameplay had to fight for attention, much like in real life. Just because something has far-reaching consequences doesn't mean it's the end-all be-all of that moment, and event triggers during gameplay capture this perfectly. While these moments are often the flashiest, the mission briefings play into this simulation of reality just as much, if in a less spectacular fashion. Free space will often outright lie or hide the truth in its briefings as a way to evoke feelings of a real conflict. War is messy, and the focus on half-truths and the unexpected plays into this by making players worry of trusting their superiors, the game, too much, and reminding them that any mission, no matter how well-planned, can go awry in an instant. The first SOC loop in Free Space 2 is probably the best example of this thanks to its espionage framing. None of the missions play out as your CO tells you with Love the Trees and immediately trashing the briefing by having you murder the rest of your squadron assigned to the escort. An evocative way to begin the mission to say the least. This series of missions also leverages the intelligence frame to keep players on their toes when But Hate the Traitor begins with your mentor and CO being reassigned and his replacement coming across as a little sadistic once the mission gets underway. He eggs you on to attack an unarmed transport, all before revealing that your cover's already been blown, likely because of the events leaking out of Love the Treason. None of this is to say these plot points or setups couldn't be done with cinematics or other high-budget production techniques, but with limited resources often come simple yet compelling story structures. Additionally, text allows for far more individualized pacing than a cutscene would. With the rhythm of briefing text to gameplay to debriefing comes a built-in story arc for every mission, complete with setup, climax, and resolution. What this style of gameplay and storytelling also accomplishes is continuously grounding players in the world they're visiting. Every briefing is a reminder of what you're fighting for, both in the grand scheme and at the moment. Every plane laid before you has the potential of flying off the rails. Every mission is a fight for your own survival. The rigid structure is both a stylistic choice and a way to reinforce the militaristic nature of most of these types of stories. That doesn't mean this rhythmic and rigid structure can't work with other stories. The real problem lies with how dead the style is mainly due to the prevalence of cinematics and the original genres using it having died almost two decades ago. Text-heavy games, of course, are still around. Obsidian's newfound success through Kickstarter's proof enough, not to mention Valhalla and other visual novel-type games' growing reach. The RPG simply moved away from its roots, and Obsidian proved those roots are still full of life, while visual novels have slowly grown more international as access to those games gets easier thanks to digital distribution and non-Japanese developers working more in the genre. 
The space and Mexim genres are practically dead now, and while I adore the existence of Brigador and House of the Dying Sun, these games can't resurrect their respective genres on their own. It's a shame, because the 90s took this storytelling style with it, and no one has picked it back up or further explored the style ever since. It's a style that can build incredible worlds while also leveraging the gameplay and building a natural flow into the experience. It's a style at home in niche genres, and its low-budget nature is exactly why I'm so sad to see it languishing in the past. Part 3. Loving Text Boxes while I focused on a specific style of cheap story for this video, everything I've brought up already has at least a degree of applicability to any game relying heavily on text. Really, the biggest boon to using text is how flexible and close to the final product it is, meaning more time can be spent tuning word choice than on putting the words themselves into the game. What all this time spent on the wording hopefully will accomplish is giving the text itself a personality that fits nicely with the rest of the experience. Similar to the camera work in a cutscene, the writing style of a game is its own tool, it's just not as flashy and even more reliant on personal taste. With Brigador, its dark humor wrapped around a business-like tone fits perfectly with the cyberpunk-esque aesthetic and the absurdity of having mechs in the first place. Tyranny and Pillars of Eternity take a more bookish and slow-paced approach to go with their fantastical and deeply human stories. Valhalla is almost entirely dialogue in keeping with its small personal stories made possible by the bar it's set in. What I just said shouldn't be earth-shattering to anyone, but I feel in an industry so caught up in the tech arms race, highlighting the simple beauty of text and writing styles is an important thing to do. As a final note, one of the most emotionally engaging moments of Nier Automata for me was an optional novel in Route C. Instead of a lengthy cutscene with changing voiceover from Devil and Popolo, we're told the two's story through some simple on-screen text styled like modern interactive fiction. While this decision was certainly made, at least in part, due to time and money, having you fill in all the holes that the simple narration and conversation leaves is another way to get players to empathize with these characters, particularly if they played the original Nier. What exactly you imagine these characters doing, based on how each has remembered the events, will have far more impact on you personally than whatever the budget and schedule would allow a cutscene to have. There's power in interpretation, and given Nier and Yokotara's propensity for forcing you to think about what you're doing, text is an ideal way of teasing out even more thought from the player. Another striking thing about Nier Automata's text is its formatting. It's a small but hugely important piece of why this lengthy, for the game, bit of text is so well crafted. There's a ton of blank space, and each button press usually only shows a phrase or to before requiring another press to show more. This emphasizes the words in a way that a book can't. We're forced to see certain phrases in a vacuum. A character's thoughts and words flow a little closer to how they might have said or thought what we read. None of this would be possible if we were just given paragraph upon paragraph of text to read. What I hope choosing to leave you with Nier does is spark your own thoughts about how we tell stories with games. To understand that cost is certainly a factor when we see text in a game, but no, it's not the only reason we find it there. That text can be inviting. That it gives you some ownership that it can be as beautiful as anything else in a game, that we should embrace the cheap and the low-tech even if we're in a technical medium, 